Evening. Welcome to Revelation or Imagination, Epistemology for Christians. Actually, Epistemology for anybody, but I'm going to be focusing on some aspects of, of that are related specifically to theism, I guess, writ large. First, we want to answer is, what is epistemology for those who don't know it? I mean, I know Aditya knows what epistemology is, but it's not a term that people normally throw around in everyday conversation. And more importantly, why should we care about epistemology if we're not philosophy majors? And the rest of the introduction will give away some of the definition, but what we want to understand is how can we know what is true? And true about reality in general, and then true about God in particular. So I'm not just going to talk about this on a theoretical level, but also very much into the rubber meets the road of how does this, what is, how does this matter in day-to-day -day life? In other words, how do we live in response to this concept that we call epistemology? So it's always good to start with definitions when you're using humongous words. So epistemology, according to dictionary.com, the esteemed source, epistemology is, quote, a branch of philosophy that investigates the origin, nature, methods, and limits of human knowledge. So some of the questions it tries to answer, what does it mean to know something? What do we actually know? What can we know that we don't know already? And then how do we come to know the things that we know? How do we know what we know, which can make your head hurt when you think about too much? But again, this is all fine, you know, philosophy 101 stuff, so why should we care? So, what is this? Oh, come on, y'all are like literate. You know what this is. It's a Percocet, yes. How do you know it's a Percocet? That's help, yep. So, Percocet is a painkiller. It's a prescription. It's a, it's a very strong prescription painkiller. Yeah, very, very strong. So, and um, so if I told you that I purchased these, that I went to CVS with a prescription from my doctor and gave the pharmacist a prescription and a certain amount of money and they gave me a bag of these, would you say with confidence that, yeah, this is a Percocet? Yeah. If I told you I bought this from my friend at school, maybe not. Sadly, this happens all the time. There is an 18-year-old named Caden from Centerville who bought what he thought was Percocet, and it turned out to be a failed dose of fentanyl. He paid for that mistake with his life. I'm not saying this to be gratuitously morbid, but to just make it clear that we should care because objective truth is, if objective truth is the difference, and knowing what the objective truth is the difference between making a decision where we get the outcome we want and making a decision where we get the outcome that we don't want or don't expect. And medicine is an obvious one. I mean, you, it's not just a matter of my doctor prescribed it, but it also comes with instructions. And most people read the instructions before they take it because they want it to do something good for them not something bad for them. And they consider the instructions that come with it a source of objective truth about the properties and effects of that medication. Driving a car, lots of objective truth needs to be involved near. What's around me? Why, where is it going? What rules does it follow? If I'm coming down the street and a car is coming at me at a 90 degree angle, but there's this octagonal sign sticking up out of the ground, do I feel confident that that means I'm going to get to go without getting T-boned? You know, that there are a bunch of objective rules of the road that we follow when we drive. And Ikea. <laughs> and I know the world has two kinds of people. There are people who unpack everything and then open the instructions, make sure all the parts are there, and then follow step by step. And then there are people who wing it. But I'm just saying that even there, it's, there's, an object, you know, there's objective information in the instructions about how to assemble the thing. And what we do or don't do with that information can make a dramatic difference in the outcome that we get. But even going back a step, because notice I got underlined knowing objective truth. So the first question we got to ask is, what is truth? Again, making sure we got our definition straight before we start building on it. Again, dictionary.com. 
Truth, true is defined as being in accordance with the actual state or conditions, conforming to reality or fact, not false. So in other words, that the way things are. It's an accurate description of reality, either internal or external. It works for both. It's after sunset in College Park, Maryland, it is an objective truth. It is true outside of myself. I feel nervous is a true statement, but it's an internal truth. It is, it, is, it is a subjective truth, it is a truth that if I suddenly disappeared from view, the sun would still be down in College Park, but there would be, would be no me to be nervous anymore. So what's objective truth? Again, objective truth is what exists outside of the mind. It's based on facts that you can prove. And for instance, universal gravitation. Objects attract each other with a force proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Subjective truth, on the other hand, is dealing the realm of ideas, feelings, or experiences. These are things that exist in the mind rather than the outside world. Again, I feel nervous is a subjective statement. Now, if you were to say, you know, that I have an elevated heart rate, that there is more perspiration than usual in my armpits, you know, other things like that, you could say there are things that po objectively point to my subjective state, but ultimately my nervousness is, is, you know, I feel nervous is a subjective statement. Any references to my truth, your truth, anybody else's truth is inherently subjective. So that's one thing we have to consider with this. Whenever anybody makes a statement and, and attaches a personal prong to the world truth, they've got to be talking about subjectivism, not objectivism. Because if it's objective, it's true for everybody at all times and all places. So, quiz. Objective truth or subjective truth? Honda makes minivans. Is that objectively or subjectively true? Objectively. objectively true. I just drove one here. Driving a Honda minivan makes you cool. Subjectively. Yep. Although for me, it's a yeah. look at me. Okay. Try one. Pigeons have two legs and two wings. Is that objective truth or subjective truth? Objective. Say again. It's objective truth. That is correct. You look at a you look at a pigeon. You can see how it's constructed. Pigeons are tasty. Subjective. Yes, I think they are. Although to be honest, there's not a whole lot to them. It's like a Cornish game hen, where it's like ninety nine percent rice and like one percent, you know, the muscle that basically connects the wing. But the point, okay. But yeah, it's a subjective statement. Murder is wrong. Objective. Not everybody agrees. But they should look at your last lecture on that. Very good. But <laughs> but the point is, yeah, but there are some areas that where this will come into, fa into play. I think murder is, if, if murder isn't objectively wrong, then we're in trouble because, yeah, that means I have freedom to do it. And for somebody to object to it, it's like, you know, I don't like eggplant. I like murder. What's the problem? They're equally meaningful statements. <laughs> So we talk, we talk, so we unpacked a little bit of objective truth. What about knowledge? Plato's epistemological formulation. I actually got that out of my mouth without tripping over it. Knowledge is justified true belief, or JTB for short. The true part we've already talked about. The idea of something objectively true is, it is, it is a correct assessment of reality outside of ourselves. Belief and I know I use dictionary.com like crazy. Confidence in the truth or existence of something not immediately susceptible to rigorous proof. So in other words, there are times we can't immediately prove everything that we believe to be true. There's some things where we just have to say, I have good reasons for believing this. For instance, I believe Poland exists even though I've never been there. I would love to. You know, I've seen pictures, I've seen it on a map, but on the other hand, you know, Ukraine's on a map and the Russians don't believe it exists. I mean, it's... So there, it's so you know for things that we cannot immediately rigorously prove, we have we can still have a justified belief. Again, that if you get a prescription from your doctor, unless you have the expertise and equipment, you're not going to be able to do a chemical breakdown of the medication to be sure that it's exactly what you paid for. You're relying on the expertise of others to say yes, this is what this is, this is what this does, and that comes into the justified part. That's got to be warranted. That it's it's, an, it's a justified belief. If it's warranted or well grounded. How many of y'all have ever played the game where they've got a 
you know, a, a jar full of gumballs or Skittles or Pez or whatever, and you're supposed to guess how many. Okay, we've, we've all seen this before. You ever seen one where somebody got it exactly right? It happens. If someone gets it exactly right, did they have a justified true belief? No, because, they, you know, I mean, you can do, some people do the calculations, they get the little tape measure out, and they're measuring it, they're calculating the radii and all the rest of this stuff. But I could blow all that up by just shoving a brick into the middle of it and covering it with gumballs. So they don't, you know, they have a belief, and it does happen to be true that there are, you know, 3,965 gumballs or whatever in the jar, but it's not justified because they don't, you know, they, they, they guessed. And again, a guess, that's, um, a guess that happens to be true isn't knowledge. It's an important distinction. Sometimes we guess things right, but that is not, this is not just, that's not knowledge. That's luck. An assertion without support is not knowledge. And the reason I'm bringing that one up is just that the internet is absolutely rife with assertions and people don't seem to understand the difference between an assertion and an argument. An argument is going to contain the things that are going to help you get to establish, you know, get to the point of justified true belief and something or a justified belief that it's false. An assertion is just a statement without any kind of supporting information. Go ahead, Aditya. That's a good, that's an excellent question. We could be here all night with that one. I mean, in, I would say warranted in the sense that the preponderance of evidence suggests that something is true. That, or that, that, that being true explains a greater proportion of the available facts than any of, than any of the alternatives. Because it's gonna be difficult to, I mean, science, if, if we ever had, if we had to rely on just every single piece of evidence fitting exact, the exact model we have, we never get any science done because we very rarely ever find things where 100% of all of the observed available evidence indicates this. But it's a question of, do, you know, is there enough evidence to make a case that this is true? Now, again, there are things people can have very, you know, can have intelligence disagreements on because they may weigh the, they may weigh the evidence differently. That certain pieces of information are more valid than others. Or they may have, you know, other, there, there may be, uh, sometimes people bring their own philosophical underpinnings or other things into the discussion. But yeah, in, in one sense, I'm going to be doing it a little more cut and dried in, in, in that there are things that people, honest people, have disagreements about. Again, that's how science, at least is how science is supposed to work. You know, I bring my, you know, I bring my evidence to the table and I don't cherry pick and the other side brings their evidence to the table. They don't cherry pick. We look at everything and we try to make conclusion, okay, what of the possible explanations that we are aware of which one best explains the evidence. Another way of thinking about it is in a court of law, you know, where the, you know, you have a bunch of evidence, you have a bunch of exhibits or whatever, and then the prosecution presents one narrative that is intended to explain all the available evidence, and the defense brings forth a narrative that's supposed to explain all the available evidence. And what the jury's ultimately got to figure out is which one, you know, assuming that nobody's lying under oath, which one of these two scenarios that's being presented more likely fits a greater preponderance of the evidence. Because there's always, I mean, that's, that's, that's why we have all the conspiracy theories about 9-11 and JFK and everything else, is because there's always a piece of evidence lying around here and there that doesn't fit the established narrative. Sorry, that was probably starting to turn into more of a, a second lecture. Does that help at all as far as, I'm not gonna be able to define it down to, to 60 decimal places, and a lot of this is still kind of theoretical, but I think it's a good question. And I will dive a little bit more into that because yeah, how do we justify what we believe to be true? So let's summarize what we got so far. Oh, it's, 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 let's summarize what we got so far as far as an example. And again, talking about prescri prescribed medication, I go to see, you know, I've got a sinus infection. My doctor says, here's a, here's a um, prescription for whatever antibiotic is, is the thing now. Go to CVS, fill it. I mean, I have an expectation that this, taking this medicine is going to make my sinus infection go away. Why? Because I've, what are the justifications for this, where, where does justification come in? Because I've read the instructions about its use and its effects. 
I'm planning on following them. I'm confident that they accurately affect, reflect objective reality. Why? Because I'm confident that the manufacturer is telling the truth about how to use it and what it does. Why? Because I'm confident that the government is providing sufficient oversight of the pharmaceutical industry to keep me safe. Now again, are these things absolute lock dead? No, because you know, obviously the pharmaceutical companies pull funny things and you hear, you know, I have no idea. And the pharmacist could very well be putting, you know, salt tablets in my container because they want to sell, you know, because they want to sell the stuff on the open market or whatever. I mean, the possibility exists, but the fact is that there are a number of different fail safes. There are a number of, of reasons where I have to, you know, where I have people who are holding other people accountable to, keep me safe. And the point is, if I think it's likely that even one of these things is false, if I don't think the instructions are objectively true, if I think the manufacturer is, is, is not telling the truth, if I think that the government's turning the other way because they're getting paid off, whatever, I'm not taking the medicine. You know, I, because I don't think at that point I have a justified true belief. Now, you know, again, where, where you draw the line where you cross into unjustified versus justified, that's, that's, a much, that's, that's more challenging. But I think in this case, at least we can say this is a belief and not an assertion because I'm not just saying, oh, it's safe or, you know, oh, trust me. But that there are objective reasons, you know, there are objective fail safes that are in place to ensure that people are going to give you the straight stuff when they give you this stuff. So at the risk of making things even more complicated, what justified true belief determine what you ate for supper? And for most of you, I assume it's not that. <laughs> so what justified true belief led to your, was, was be, what, what justified true beliefs were involved in your consumption of deliciousness from Chick-fil-A? Um, I should have taken more of functionalist approach mm -hmm. where if our cognitive faculties are sort of like planting upward if our cognitive faculties are working as they're supposed to be working in accordance with their design plan mm -hmm. then we have warranted belief and so because you know there's nothing wrong with my brain um, because I was my, my cognitive functions were able to tell oh I ordered Chick-fil-A this is a burger from Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. um, and since they were working in accordance with their design, um, I have just I have warranted belief that I ate Chick Fil A for dinner. Okay. How? Where's the base of your belief that what you ate for Chick Fil A? I guess let me back up. Why did you eat Chick Fil A for dinner? Why did you eat anything for dinner at all? What was your objective? Uh, I was hungry. Okay. You were hungry, and your objective then was to satiate the hunger. How do you know that eating that eating the burger Chick Fil A was going to do that? Um, and I'm not saying it's to put you on the spot, but just to kind of help unpack what this looks like. Proof by induction. Yeah. I've eaten dinner on several occasions mm -hmm. and know that I, my hunger is satisfied. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the preponderance of evidence suggests that if I eat, my hunger will be satiated. Mm -hmm. satiated. So if you eat glass, will your hunger be sated? No. Why not? Because that is a suitable food stuff. Okay. So I'm saying, but there's another part of it that's yeah. a justified true belief, not only in terms of that putting something in my gullet is going to satisfy the hunger, but that there are some, some things that are going to be helpful and some others that aren't. And again, I mean, I could have had, you know, you could have had an ice cream sundae for supper. Why not? I mean, the creamery is closed now, I guess, so that's probably not the question. But that depends. Sometimes it might be a good idea. <laughs> Fair. But, but uh, okay, again, um, although at this point we're referring a lot of the time to truths that we've been handed and we have to rely on whether we believe in those sources of authority. Mm -hmm. So we, the, our education leads us to believe um, that eating too much of something like ice cream, which is high in fat and high in sugar, is not ideal for our health. Um, there is also some evidence that we'll have seen to suggest that um, from observing one's weight mm -hmm. if eating too much of said food stuff. Yep. And I think also, at least from my own experience, is you know, my energy level tends to go vertical and then goes vertical downward not too long afterward. You get you know, this massive spike in blood sugar and then I feel like trash instead of having the more you know, nice slow burn of a, of a couple logs on the fire. So yeah. 
these are some now we're not consciously necessarily consciously aware of this but we're doing this stuff all the time you know we're saying that you know it's nutritious that's going to be a good value for my money because again you know you go downstairs and, and there's a lot of different choices that are available that it's going to taste the same as the last time that I tasted it and so on and so forth so there's a lot of, of these things that go on because as you said Raman you can't we can't prove all this stuff every single time we eat. I mean, you're not going to go in with a calorimeter and put your entire order in and see what the calorie count comes in and then, you know, figure out from your own historical charting of your own caloric consumption of what you need. I mean, and justified true belief, part of it is going to be, you know, the justifi that justified means that I got it from a reliable source because we can't be experts on everything. So... To say we know an objective truth means we're confident because we have good reasons to be that something we believe is consistent with objective reality. And the reason I'm saying, you know, it's confident because that's as far as we can go. I mean, there's always going to be, again, some piece of information somewhere that's going to run counter to the model that we have. Or there was just information we can't have. I mean, there are poisons out there that are, you know, tasteless and odorless that somebody could very well have dropped in your burger and you're not going in. But the preponderance of evidence is that, you know, this isn't going to happen. So then how do we get to the point of knowing something? And we've, we've touched on this already a little bit in talking about expert understanding, things like that. But let's, let's dig in a little bit more. Two kinds of knowledge. There are things we learn from direct sensory experience. For instance, my keys fell to the floor when I let them go. That is knowledge. I just and I acquired that knowledge by op by opening my hand and seeing what the keys would do. That's also called a priori knowledge, or from what is later. You know, I observe it, and then it becomes incorporated into my knowledge. The other kind is reason, things we learn from reason, which usually is reason applied to sensory experience. Because when I drop the keys from the same height, assuming all their conditions are equal, they're always going to take the exact same amount of time to hit the ground because of the wonder of universal gravitation. And in fact, repeatability and all of the bedrock principles of science are ultimately based on reason. They start with observations, but that ultimately they're something that are concluded from, re they're concluded from reason. So the two go together, and we'll often call this a priori knowledge or what is before. So we have the observations, and then reason helps us put them together and make a picture out of it and figure out, okay, what are the implications of this? How do I apply these two situations that are different from me pulling my keys out and dropping them on the ground? So another quiz, empirical or reason? Bob is Caucasian. Do we know that from, do we know that from direct observation or do we know that from reason? You could argue either one, actually, for this one. Both. Both. I mean, empirically, well, I mean, but empirically, you can look at all my paperwork. You can look at my family tree and find a whole bunch of Pollocks on it. You can watch me running with warmer than 50 degrees outside without, with running without a shirt on, and you have, like, this Paul at Damascus moment where you're blinded by this flash of light. <laughs> so there's a lot of empiricism you can use to, to get to come, to come to that. On the other hand, okay, let's say Bob's married with two kids. Is that empirical or reason? Hey, marriage certificate. I mean, this would, you know, would be the, the wing would be empirical evidence. You see me with my family. Bob's wife and kids love him very much. Empirical or reason? Reason. Mm hmm Can't observe it. They can say it, which is certainly a bit of empirical evidence, but ultimately it's going to be, you know, the proof is in, in the way we relate to each other. Bob is fascinated by esoteric details that interest only him. Empirical or reason? Reason. Although I certainly provide enough empirical evidence that that's the case. <laughs> but it's looking at the observations of all my quirks and kind of putting the pieces together and saying, okay, this is the model of, of how this works. So, since objective truth is ground outside of us, 
Knowing an objective truth, again, is being confident, for good reason, that something we believe is consistent with objective reality. And we can learn truth by observing things, by a priori knowledge, and by using reason, a posteriori, to draw additional conclusions, put the pieces together. And one of the questions, what about feelings and all this stuff? Feelings and personal preferences are internal to us. So they're useful for, for finding subjective truth, but not objective truth. So, what does all this have to do with God, since this is epistemology for Christians? If God exists objectively, I, he exists outside of us. He exists the same way that the table exists, the bag exists, my keys exist. That means we can only learn about him through observation the and reason. But if God exists outside of his material, material creation, in other words, if we're not pantheists, how can we possibly learn about him through observation? Are we stuck? That's why the picture's there, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so how do we move forward with this? Because it's an important question, because in one sense, you know, like other things I can learn about scrambled eggs and universal gravitation and things like that through observation and through reason. Two ways forward. One is that God leaves evidence of existence in the material universe, which we call general revelation. And it's similar to the idea of evidence as a crime scene. The suspect's not there now, but has left evidence behind. So if I go into a room and I find a guy lying on his stomach with a knife sticking out of his back in a pool of, his own, in a pool of blood, and there's a bunch of footprints leading out the door, the, it, it seems very reasonable to conclude that the, you know, the person who did this isn't in the room. So in other words, I have evidence, and, but that's, you know, so I'm purporting that some other person exists who actually did this, that the guy didn't do it himself. So it's similar to what we have to do with, with criminal cases, where you don't have, you know, if you don't have pictures of somebody convict, can, you know, committing the crime, but you have other pieces of evidence that show that they were present, that in this case with the crime scene, there was something, someone from outside of, who was outside of it, who did things inside this room to cause this outcome. This thing did not make itself happen. So for instance, in the case of God, the beginning of the universe is an example of a piece of evidence that, you know, or basically fingerprints as it were, evidence that God, that, that God exists. That something, because the idea that, that something outside the material universe had to have brought the material universe into existence rather than the pro positing that the material universe somehow brought itself into existence out of nothing. The order and complexity of the universe is another example where, you know, where the, the fact that it is not only why do we have something but not rather than nothing, but why is it that we have a something that is so incredibly complex if it wasn't, if there wasn't any kind of an intelligence behind it. And I'll talk more about this next, next time I go through evidence, of, you know, evidence for God's existence. But the idea behind this, and Paul makes the same argument in Romans chapter 1, is that some of the way that God has, that we, that we find evidence for God is evidence in terms of things that he has left in creation or done to creation that strongly indicate that there was outside, an outside actor. Again, just like with my guy, you know, the dead guy on the floor and the bloody, you know, the bloody um, footprints and everything, that there's, there's, re there's strong reason to believe that an outside actor who, who wasn't, isn't present right now was involved. The other parts what we call specific revelation, where God communicates directly to humanity. And that can be in written form, sacred books. And for those who are wondering for this, this is actually a depiction of Moses about to smash the original edition of the Ten Commandments. Verbal, um, in the form of prophecy. But then, you know, this leads to a very important question. How do we know whether or not any of the myriad books, utterances, and so on claiming to be divine revelation are actually originating from a God external to the universe and not just somebody's fantasies. And ways to answer that question, and again, I talk about this in more detail in, another, in, in, in the, the Reliability New Testament, which, yeah, we got the recording of that now. Can the authors be trusted to tell the truth? 
you know, could they have known it and could they, you know, and would they have told the truth about it is one of the questions we, uh, we ask about. And that's true for any kind of historical claim. Is this claim revelation consistent with other relevant historical information? One of the great things about scripture is that it is rooted in history. It's not just a whole bunch of, of you know, of assertions or propositions that have no anchoring at all in the historical narrative. And so we can look at the historical narrative and say, is this congruent? It doesn't prove it, but it certainly gives us more confidence. You know, say in looking at, you know, the archaeological evidence for the Old and New Testament records versus the archaeological lack of evidence for the Book of Mormon. And then is another important question is if this is something that's not contemporary, is what they wrote what we have now or did it get altered? as time went on. And again, I'm not going to, you know, the purpose of this particular talk is not to break that down to why I believe that the Bible is God's specific revelation to humanity, but to just express, just to explain how we think about the notion of epistemology when it comes to God. How do we know what we know about him? So again, coming back to the beginning, just to tie everything together. So since Again, if objective truth is grounded outside of us, by definition, that knowing an objective truth means that we have a confidence that something we believe is consistent with objective reality. That we, we, the, the mental model we have of something is consistent with what is supported by observation, you know, by observation of the world around us. And we can learn these objective truths by observing things external to us, and then by using reason to draw additional conclusions and kind of fill in, not exactly fill in the gaps, but, but see how it fits into a coherent framework. And again, the challenge with epistemology and God is that we can't directly observe him because he exists outside of material reality, but he's left evidence of his presence, and as we call it, general revelation, and he's also revealed himself to us, I believe through the Bible, which is specific revelation that God has also communicated direct truth to us that cannot be just inferred by looking at the world around us. So let's look at, let's take a step and look at how this apply, what this means for life in general. And I've already covered, talked about this a little bit, but the idea is if our understanding of reality can have serious consequences, then we better have our facts straight. We make thousands of decisions, big ones and small ones every single day and the decisions we make are ultimately rooted in our understanding of reality. If we thought reality was different, we would make different decisions. But this, yeah, if, if, if it can get overwhelming when you think about the sheer number of decisions we make every single day. We make decisions about what to wear, what to eat, who to talk to, who not to talk to, how to use our time, and so on so on, so forth. And one of the questions that come up is, is who's got time for this? Like if, if, if I'm talking about, you know, being conscious of our epistemology and all these different life decisions, how on earth are we ever going to get everything done? Especially now that we live in the age of the iPhone where we can be exposed to knowledge about anything, everything, and everything else anytime we want. And this is where I think filtering is really important. We're not going to learn everything. We can't, but I think we do, we can benefit from doing a better job of figuring out what is it that we really need to know? What are the things that we make decisions on? And then focus on getting good answers about that. I've really tried to do that, especially with my intake of news, of, of thinking about, okay, what of the things that I could read about in the news today, which are the ones that are going to have a bearing on actual decisions I'm going to make, and which are ones that are not going to have a bearing on actual decisions I'm going to make? You know, some congressman from Montana or whatever does something stupid, makes a fool of themselves. I have, I'm never voting for them because I don't live in Montana. That's not necessarily relevant. On the other hand, if somebody who I am going to vote for makes a decision or proclamation that has direct bearing on something that's of great interest to me, I want to know more. And so I think part of the way to keep from being overwhelmed by this is to be more judicious in considering what are the things we really need to know. And it's a whole lot less than what people make you think. I mean, now, sadly, in social media, it's, you know, everybody has to not only know about everything, but to make a cogent comment on everything immediately or 
you know, you get, you know, you, pe our people assume the worst of you. And so part of it is, is learning to, well, to, to think, to be more practical and think, okay, what parts do I really need to know about? But even there, for the stuff we need to know, we can't be experts on everything. Because again, like the example I gave, you know, of, of you know, we can't be experts on nutrition, we can't be experts on medication. You know, we, we don't have, I mean, we're, you know, for, for most of us, like getting one degree is sufficient, never mind getting a whole bunch of degrees and a whole bunch of unrelated professions. And that is where, as we talked about before, we've got to find people we can trust to give us the truth about these things. It's a little scary because, yeah, if we really think about how little we actually know or how little justified true belief we have compared to the number of decisions we make, that's a bit sobering. But I do think it is, with our, we, we do need to figure out what are the things we really need to be circumspect about. What's the stuff we've got to get right? And the stuff we've got to get right, we want to have the best understanding of how reality works in order to do that. And one of them to me, like the El Numero Uno is God. Of course, I was going to say it because it's epistemology for Christians. But my reasoning is basically, if God really made the universe, then there's two very reasonable conclusions that come out of that. One is that he knows everything about it and how it works. That's pragmatism at its finest, but basically, like, who knows better how all this stuff works than the one who put it there in the first place? But another level, I think it's also perfectly reasonable, though obviously not everybody agree with me, that everything he created, including us, belongs to him in a way that nothing belongs to us. And that in addition to the pragmatic part, there's also the moral obligation of right and wrong. That it's not just a matter that I want to know stuff, I want to know what God revealed because I want to make life work. That's missing a very important part of it. The other part is what is the nature of my obligations to my creator? And when you think about it, I mean, these are the instructions for, you know, the, the um, life rafts that, the, that you are not life rafts. No one wears a life raft. The life jackets that you put on an airplane. But the point is, I mean, if we really believe that information, that knowledge about God is this critical, then why would we not be obsessed with finding out who he is, what he wants, and how his created order works? I mean, ultimately, it seems like that'd be a whole lot more important than knowing, you know, who, you know, knowing who scored how many points in, in the NBA All-Star game. And lots of points were scored because nobody plays defense. But why would we not be obsessed with knowing more about God if we really believe these things are true about him? But there's also another element to this. This isn't just a practical, you know, I want to know the secret code to make everything work. How, and this should be fresh in everybody's minds because Ross has been preaching out, how did the fall happen? What was, in, in summary, what were the essential elements that led to Adam and Eve's choice to rebel against God? Yep. So it was a drift. It was a break from the revealed truth that Satan presented a version of reality that was not congruent with what God had presented. And then Eve, you know, apparent, you know Eve's mental model of exactly what God had revealed apparently also had a, a flaw in it that Satan knew and, and took advantage of. And then, you know, Adam didn't act on his commission. And all this, basically these things which were, you know, this is ultimately about a truth versus a lie. The truth being, you know, God, the truth being that God is the sovereign creator over everything, the sovereign Lord of all, or, you know, we have not, not only that God's holding on us, but that we have the right to pursue satisfaction outside of him. Because basically Satan's most effective weapon isn't, it's not poltergeists and it's not, you know, spinning heads and green vomit. And it's not, you know, big spectacular supernatural events. It is giving a picture of reality that is at odds with what God has said to be true. 
And Jesus, quote, and this was to the Jewish authorities, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a a liar and the father of lies. That epistemology isn't just about knowing whether or not it is okay to, you know, whether or not a certain medication is going to do what you want it to do. Epistemology ultimately is the battle that is, is the battle to understand and know and live congruently with the truth that God has revealed about the universe and not live something that's a, that's a lie. You know, people talk about spiritual warfare. It's a very popular term. People have written books and all the rest of that stuff. But the biggest element of spiritual warfare, I think, is explained in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The real war is the war to understand and believe and live according to the truth that God has revealed about himself and about us. And that, to me, is where the obsession with epistemology comes in. Because what we know about God, you know, what we believe, what we know, what we believe to be true about God matters. Just as what we believe to be true about the food we eat and about the medicines we take matters. Because reality is, reality always wins in the end. So let's summarize some definitions. Truth, again, is just the way things are. Objective truth is a state of reality that is external to us. Subjective truth deals with internal realities. Knowledge is justified true belief. So it's not just a, you know, it's, it's a belief that's not just, it's, it's, how to put it, it's, it's having a belief that is congruent with the truth about external reality because we have a justification for it. Lucky guesses are not knowledge. Assertions with no arguments to back them up are not knowledge. So how do we get this knowledge? Again, we gain knowledge of objective truth by observing the external world and then by using reason to put the pieces together. And that feelings and preferences are related to subjective truth, not objective. So if God exists, this is true, then these things are true regarding knowledge about him. And the third bullet especially is important because for so many people, they believe God is a certain way because that's how they think he should be or because they want him to be. And that doesn't matter as far as the truth i mean it's their feelings and i say but it doesn't matter as far as the truth i mean again you know caden most likely thought that what he was going to take was going to make him feel good and make him forget about problems he was having with homework or dating or you know the job or whatever and that he was wrong But again, if God exists directly outside of physical reality, we can't directly observe him. And so that's where we have to depend upon general and specific revelation. So what do we do from here? Again, we need to know objective truth in order to make good decisions, big ones and small ones. But despite the age of the iPhone, we really cannot know everything about everything. So again, my suggestions are focusing on learning what is going to have the greatest potential impact on your most crucial decisions. Because even doing that, there's more than we can handle. And then again, get expert opinions, but evaluate them to the best you can, but think about these things. And again, remembering that any decision we make about our eternal destiny is going to matter more than any other decision because that's forever. You know, you buy you know you 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 buy you buy a dinner it doesn't taste particularly good or you know you get a, a, a smidge of food poisoning. I mean, it's not fun. I've had it, but you know that's going to last for song. It's over. This you know stuff with relation to God that's forever. And so that's where I think that's 
one of many reasons to diligently seek to know God. It sounds may sound utilitarian, but the reality is God has said that reality is a certain way. And, you know, it's it's like the whole thing, if you get caught doing 75 in the beltway, you can't tell the, you know, you can tell a cop all you want. You know what speed limit was. It's not going to help you. So, again, to summarize up one last part. So, without direct, since we don't have direct observation of God to anchor reason, we need revelation from him in order to know objective truth of him, about him. And we have general revelation. Again, the evidence, and I'll talk more about that next month. And then a specific revelation from Scripture. There are a lot of claims about specific revelations, so we need to carefully evaluate them to determine if any of them are true. And I talked a little bit about that last fall in the New Testament talk. You know, can and would the authors tell the truth? And do we currently have a trustworthy version of what they originally wrote? Anyway, questions, comments, discussion? Aditya. You say that um, underpinning warrant, like the basis for it, is necessarily reason. Like, for instance, um, when we're coming to a belief that's warranted, mm -hmm. is it because we reason about it, even with like our senses? Like, I like I see something, and from reason, I'm like, I see this, therefore it's true. And then even with other beliefs, uh, would you say that the, the basis for warrant is reason? That's a good question because you're right. There is a there is an underlying assumption that the sensory information that you're getting is correct, and obviously we have movies like The Matrix that show what ha you know that that show that 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 isn't necessarily you know it 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 it, it banks on the whole idea that you know no your your senses are basically being fed into the base of your skull by in, directly into your spine by a computer. So I would say it's. It is, but I think that I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to draw, to, to give reason. I, I don't want to lead to the conclusion that reason in and of itself is sufficient to figure out everything. I think they're both essential, but, and I think, you're yeah, right. I mean, to a certain extent, it's an article of faith that, you know, I'm actually talking, that you're actually talking to me and that I'm not a figment of your imagination. I, I guess, like... Is that is that kind of where you're going, or is that helpful, or am I not yeah. quite scratching the itch? Yeah, because um, I guess when I think of like how, when I think of epistemology, the thing that interests me more is sort of how does a normal person come to know something? Mm -hmm. And I'm very skeptical that like justified true belief can be based on like the like warrant for that can be based on like. Um, Evidence, like it, it certainly plays a role, but I think you can have warrant to believe something without evidence, and that's sort of where functionalism sort of comes in. And Plantinga talks about this a lot. I, I, I like I think the example of morals is like the clearest example of this because when someone like comes to the conclusion that a certain action is wrong, I don't think what's going on in their heads is they're thinking, oh, this is what the nature of God is. And as a result, we can deduce from that what is right or wrong, we can deduce from God's command. I think Hume is right in that the main way that we like come to reason about morals is just like a sort of ick factor. Like, mm -hmm. this is gross, I don't like it, therefore it's wrong. Um, so like, murder is wrong, because I don't like it. Um, and that points us to objective truth. It's not the base for objective, right. for objective morals, but our knowledge of it isn't coming from us, and, and I mean like, Obviously, there are people who are weird, like you and me, who like yeah. reason through things more than the mm -hmm. average person, right? But the uh, reason soon that was just saying that it, there's more, it's more intuitive, and then essentially the reasoning comes after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, and, and I'm, yeah, and if I came across that way, I don't, I, I that was not my intention. I don't mean, I, I'm not meaning to say that this is how in practice people typically do these things. Mm -hmm. I do think that it, this is a very help. I think this is a reliable way to do it, and I think part of the challenge is that yeah, and, and part of I think in a lot of conversations when you have people the worldviews that they haven't 
really thought this stuff through very well at all. And that's why you know, I think in Greg Kokel's tactics book that a lot of times just asking people about their worldview and having them actually unpack it and defend it in itself can be a very powerful apologetic because it demonstrates to them the incoherence and, and, and of their own worldview. So in other words, yeah, in other words, it's more about epistemology as a framework for assessing what you know rather than the actual route that you get to it. Because the thing is that you can think you can know something, but until you've actually assessed it through epistemology, you don't know whether you actually know it or not. So right. going back to the morals example with the ick factor, like you can use the ick factor to to think that you know something or to have a feeling about it, but then you can use reason afterwards to then assess whether that is true or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I think I think undergirding my beliefs is that I don't think I think you could have warrant to believe something that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. So, like I can say that this belief is warranted, even if it's not true. Mm -hmm. Like because I'm sort of taking once again this functionalist approach, like. If my brain is working properly and I come to believe something in the environment in which I should believe it according to its design plan, according to how my cognitive functions work, and it ends up not being true, like say, um, you know, I'm assessing whether or not something happened in history. Um, so are you just saying, is warrant, in, is warrant in your mind that you're defining warrant as the, the, way, the weighting that you give to things in order to come to a decision? So I guess warrant is... Um, in terms of your definition, are you using it's, it as it, a sort of self-weighting? It's sort of, it, it's hard to like, at a certain point it's hard to like keep on defining these terms, but it's sort of like um, coming to the point where like I can trust that, I, I have justification for this belief. I can, I can say that this is a belief I hold. And um, yeah, so that's... So in other words, warrant is the tipping point? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, in which case, actually, the, the issue there is that warrant, the warrant can be subject, the warrant itself can be subjective. Yeah, and so I that's going to depend on each agent. To a certain degree, yeah, I mean, I, I think of, you know, when I was a weather forecaster, I mean, we would get into very animated arguments about what the weather was. We're looking at the exact same stuff. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the same models, we're looking at the same observations, we're looking at the same thing and deriving different conclusions. And obviously, at some point, one of us got proven right, or both of us got proven wrong by the atmosphere. But that, you know, it was, we had, part of the challenge in this case, and this is where I always go back to my analogy of, of the picture puzzle, that, you know, if you have a thousand piece puzzle and someone gives you, and you have 25 of the pieces, there's plenty of room for honest people to have a disagreement about what the picture is. If you have 975 pieces, that, that room is pretty much gone at that point. And there is a challenge there because we don't know what we don't know, which means we don't really have a good understanding of what some of the sum total of all the evidence that's relevant to a particular piece of of, of knowledge. We don't know, uh, uh, you know, in front how much of it we have. And in a certain sense, I mean, that's the whole idea of the advance of science: is that with a certain number of pieces, a certain conclusion is seems to be the most sensible conclusion and generally becomes agreed upon by the scientific community, but then additional puzzle pieces become available that make it, that, that indicate that no, actually a different model of looking at things or a different picture is going to better explain the new information. And so you have that process that occurs as well, that as additional observational information becomes available, you may, that may lead you to a different set of conclusions than what you had before. Say. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, so like with epistemology in regards to God, mm -hmm. um, heavily relying on Plantinga's book on this, um, it seems like an element that wasn't talked about was um, the Holy Spirit's role mm -hmm. for Christians in coming to knowledge. Because the more I've like dwelt on how we come to religious knowledge mm -hmm. and like not just like a knowledge of demons where it's like just mere intellectual assent but actually the knowledge of God that Christ talks about like in John 17 where he's like this is eternal life that know the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ 
or um, what Paul talks about, the knowledge that surpasses understanding in Ephesians. Um, it seems that, to me, that's more so a working of the Holy Spirit rather than an effect of like our reasoning capabilities. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not like, it's not based on evidence per se, it's based on the Spirit working this knowledge in us and bringing it in our hearts. Are you talking about experiential knowledge in that sense? Um, so I think so. Because I mean, which because like prophecy would fall under prophecy would fall under this category. Yeah, but I think like for instance, I think the way that Christians normally are converted is like maybe they'll like work through some apologetic steps like mm -hmm. I did. But I think the thing at at a certain point there is a leap of faith that has to be taken, as sort of Kierkegaard talks about. And I think the push for that leap of faith is not our own reason, but the Holy Spirit giving us this knowledge yeah. and calling us. I mean, I'm, I'm a Calvinist, and I honestly believe, and I think Scripture teaches, that ultimately the, you know, God's election is decisive. God uses, the, you know, God uses reason and other faculties in order to achieve that. And the other verse, which I didn't drop in here, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when Paul is talking about his ministry, and drops the big one in, in verse 4 of the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And so I think, yeah, there is an element of this where God, only God can make a dead person alive. We are not going to come to a, we're, we're not going to come to worship of him certainly, purely by our, own, by our own faculties. On the other hand, I would posit that Christianity is entirely rational. Because I think we want to be careful not to fall off the one side of the horse and say that because it's the Holy Spirit's work, that means that this, you know, the Holy Spirit basically, you know, cor you know cores out your brain and removes it with, replaces it with something else so that you're not capable of rational thought. But I also don't want to fall off the other side of it of, you know, entirely like I found God through my own brilliance and my ability to make beautiful syllogisms. So wait, the, thing, the question then is, is that what do we say the Holy Spirit's role is in terms of agency? Because are we saying that the Holy Spirit is essentially presents evidence to allow an agent to make a decision? Or are we saying that the Holy Spirit directly influences agency? And that is one that's going to, that, that, and that's going to depend on where you fall in the Calvin, you know, between Calvinism and Arminianism. That's where you're going to fall. That, that's part of the answer, well, answer the question. Um, no. But part of it's going to come. Part of it's going to come to that. But I think. But also, I, mean, I still think. I mean, I really think. It, it, as far as as our approach to it, I still believe apologetics is essential because you know because it's. I mean, God uses. You know, God's going to use what God is going to use. You know, I'm not going. It's it's not it, it's not in the sense that I don't know, what's a good way of putting it, because that's not getting me where I want to go, and I'm thinking I'm verbally processing this being recorded. Oh well. <laughs> Edit anyway, but you know again I, I I I in either case again it's I'm I'm thinking of I've, I definitely want to avoid the two extremes of that you know nobody has a justified true belief in God unless they you know no apologetics from A to Z or on the other hand say that you know apologetics is is antithetical to dependence upon the holy spirit and i think you kind of can see both people falling in both those extremes i don't understand precisely how the two fit together you know we've been arguing you know, i mean people people with much bigger brains than mine have been argue, have been arguing very cogently on both sides of this issue for a couple thousand years now so what would you say is our basis for religious knowledge then like Obviously, like there's there's a mix in which the Holy there's instrumental means mm -hmm. by which the Spirit brings like faith to us. But would you say that the root ultimately of our epistemological uh, thinking into like having this faith would be the Holy Spirit's work, or is it something internal to us? I would posit that the, the role of the Holy Spirit isn't as much of a revelatory one as much as us giving, giving us the capacity to accept the truth of what has been revealed. I think the revelation has been done through the scripture, the revelation has been done through obviously the general revelation. There are obviously in, you know, numerous instances of, of, of extra-biblical instances in which 
you know, God has chosen to reveal himself to, you know, you hear about missionaries and, and very, there's all kinds of, of accounts throughout the, through the centuries that have done that. But I think for, you know, for us, I think the bigger struggle is not with, is with, with the evidence, it's with the nature of the evidence itself as much as with the, the you know, do I really want this to be true or not? Mm-hmm. And if I don't want this to be true, because I mean, it's, it's terrifying. When you really think about the idea that there is a God at whose mercy we are entirely at, where he created us, he can bring us out of existence in a moment, he is completely justified in doing whatever, you know, that he is, he is the standard of good, there is no standard by which we can measure him. That's terrifying. You know, you get the, the whole, the, the, the C.S. Lewis quote, you know, Aslan is, is, you know, he's not safe, but he's good. And for a lot of people, you know, especially people who have been hurt by the church, that is a terrifying, or, you know, that's a terrifying prospect. So I think the challenge isn't, you know, the, the, real, her, 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 the real hurdle that has to be overcome is volitional rather than intellectual. I think the evidence is there, and I think Christianity holds, is, is, is very rational. I think at this point it's a volitional. And I want to tread lightly with that because I'm not saying that to cast shade on people who are in those. You know, there's some people who have some very real pain who are, you know, and, and I'm not trying to poo-poo it saying, oh, you know, you're just being a bunch of ignoramuses or whatever. You know, that, that's not what this is about. There's, there's more to it. But I think we also do need to understand, I mean, the what we believe is is rational what we believe i think explains the ev- the preponderance of evidence better than than anything else that isn't that isn't the issue but that when we're but it also means that when we're interacting with people who's are struggling on the volitional end of things the direct frontal assault with more with more truth is not typically going to get the job done you know, there are other things. I've been reading some things recently, I guess, the culture now, and I, it, it, it's hard for me to grasp it, but in some sense I get that for many people now, especially in, you know, the, the you know, college students, that the bigger question is not, is Christianity true, but is Christianity good? And there's a part of me that wants to just like, well, if you have no objective standard of good, that's a completely meaningless question. But on the other hand, like, no, God made us with emotions as well as with intellect, and that we have to... You know, while I don't, one of the things I want to bring across the talk is that emotions are not a way to find objective truth. But that also doesn't mean that we just say that emotions are absolutely irrelevant and we just toss them out the window. That, that there are still, there's understanding how, where people are coming from emotionally can often be the key to helping them to, gra- you know, to accept and grasp the, intellect, you know, the intellectual portion. It's not just a matter of dropping a bunch of propositional truths on people. We have, I mean, I mean, here, I mean, anybody right now on their phone can get, you know, all the apologetics information they could ever want and then some. That's not the issue anymore. Anyway, I'm going to start rambling. It's already, oh, it's 8.05, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Those are really good questions, though. And it's one of those things we're, again, like, trying to figure out, like, not to just tie ourselves in knots to the point of indecision of, oh, my goodness, I don't have, you know, I, I don't have enough of a confident, justified, true belief to decide whether, you know, I'm going to, you know, I, I don't, you know, whether whether I'm going to order the, ha- you know, the, the cheeseburger, or the double cheeseburger or whatever. Like, you don't, it's not about, pr- but I think we do, especially in an age with such horrific information overload, I think we, there's room for being circumcised. And also in an age where more and more of people's beliefs about God, even within the church, are falling into a realm of subjectivity rather than objectivity. I want to be one of those people standing on the tracks, waving my arms, saying stop, because like, this is not going to end well. God is who God is. And how we want him to be doesn't change that. We have to deal with God. We, we, have to, we have to relate to God as he is and not as how we want him to be. And again, that should be something that, that in and of itself should be something that drives us to deep study of the word. If we really honestly believe that we can't figure this stuff out for ourselves, then anyway, I'll keep rambling all night. Thank you.
I'll leave you to make the judicious edits to the. <laughs> <laughs>